Good afternoon. Well, it's a new year and a new reality. Um, last year and the last few uh, aging at altitude uh, seminars uh, and expos have been held at the JCC, the Jewish Community Center in Boulder. Uh, this year is our first virtual expo and webinar series. My name is Al Manzi. I'm president and CEO for Prairie Mountain Media, publisher of the camera and moderator for today's uh, session. I wanna welcome everyone to what is our seventh webinar in the Aging at Altitude series. It's entitled Arthritis, Spring Forward with Arthritis. And before we get rolling, I'd like everyone to notice on the bottom of your screen, if you mouse over it, you'll see a Q&A box or a chat box. Anytime during the presentation, when you think of a question, you heard something you're not sure about, uh, you can go into the, either of those boxes and type in your question. Dr. Gronset will speak for about 40 minutes today, and then there'll be about 20 minutes for question and answers. So type in your questions and we'll keep this session going right up to one o'clock. Reminder um, the daily, that you can go to dailycamera.com slash backslash aging to visit our virtual expo. Um, those of you who have come to our expos in the past um, know that there's a lot of great information from our partners in that virtual expo. Now let's get started. Dr. Cliff Gronset, owner of Spine West in Boulder, has been a presenter at our Aging at Altitude seminars for the past few years. He's truly a great resource and a great doctor. So please welcome Dr. Cliff Gronset. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, arthritis. Now arthritis is a fairly large topic. We're going to try to cover as much of the relevancy for an overview of arthritis as best we can. The, the goals are to one, explain the types of arthritis that you should be aware of, uh, what you can do about it, and perhaps what is coming down the pike in the future. So uh, let's just begin right away. And as Al Manzi said, please type in your questions and we can address those at the end. So the big thing about arthritis is that there's over a hundred types of arthritis. Uh, arthro means joint, itis means inflammation. So arthritis is simply a wastebasket term for inflamed joint. Any of the joints in your body, including your spine can get inflamed or can become painful. The, the key thing about arthritis is knowing what's dangerous, what's potentially harmful, and what's not. That is the one take home message I'd like you to, to receive from this webinar today. Uh, the, the key for the arthritis is that if you have the red flags, which include unexplained pain at night, pain that wakes you up at night, that is not explained uh, by any, any other source, uh, weight loss, fevers, chills, any type of general uh, malaise type of symptoms, especially at night, those are what we call in the healthcare system, the red flags. And red flags are sometimes indicative of something onerous like cancer. So if you have kind of non-motion based pain, pain that aches at night, definitely seek medical attention. That's the number one take home message. Joints, any of the joints can be affected with arthritis. There are patterns that develop with certain types of arthritis. The, the joints that are typically affected are the large joints, the knees, the shoulders, the hips, but the small joints in the wrist and hand, for example, are classically involved with rheumatoid arthritis. Gout, which is another type of arthritis, will typically affect the extremities, especially the big toe. Why the big toe? because gout, of all things, is a crystal deposit inside of the joint. And if your foot gets cold, it's purely a temperature dependent disease. As the fluid inside the joint cools, 
little crystals will form inside the joint space. And that's like having sand in your, in your engine or you know, pebbles in your shoes. It is a very strong irritant. In fact, gout and the, what they call the crystalline arthritis, gout, pseudogout, et cetera, those can be the most painful. They typically involve one joint at a time. And uh, as you've heard about in the 1800s, the Pickwickian syndromes of uh, drinking wine, et cetera, that is usually associated with these crystalline deposits inside the joints. The, the other, so you've got the arthritis family that involves crystals in the joints. You have generalized autoimmune called inflammatory types of arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, which is the most common. You can see here uh, a mild deformities of the fingers, but if untreated, it, be, it can become quite pronounced. The thing about rheumatoid arthritis is it can hit at any age, young to old, uh, typically affects folks who are, are older, uh, over 50, uh, but you can get juvenile arthritis. And it oftentimes involves multiple joints and is symmetrical. So in this picture, you can see the, the hands have these deformed fingers. The fingers are kind of splayed to the side because the joint sp space, the capsule has been eroded away, but it is symmetrical. There are blood tests that you can use to identify rheumatoid arthritis. They're pretty good. They're not 100% accurate. You can have uh, something called a rheumatoid factor, which can implicate the diagnosis of rheumatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, but the rheumatoid factor is not always positive. So it is a it is a complex of clinical symptoms combined with the labs, which oftentimes will give the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. This is now a more treatable disease with the new medications they have for controlling some of the inflammation. The other disease that we typically think of is osteoarthritis. Now this looks fairly similar to the previous picture, but you'll notice that they actually have take my little fancy pointer here, you have little knobs at the ends of the fingers. This is classic for osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is kind of degenerative wear and tear type of arthritis. Not always symmetrical. Uh, it may be genetic, especially if your parents had these knobby type of fingers, especially in the distal knuckles, that is classic for osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis, which oftentimes will get this, these sets of joints, these knuckles right here where the hand meets the fingers. So that is the big difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. The, the, the diagram here shows kind of a, a healthy joint. You've got bone next to bone lined with this rubbery cartilage, which acts as a very slick, nice gliding surface for the joint to move quite well. Surrounding all of your joints are something called the capsule. And you can see these little layers of tissue here. And that is a, like a sealed bag, saran wrap around the, each of your joints. Inside of the joint is fluid. And the fluid is what accumulates and makes a joint swell uh, when you have a, a large joint. Osteoarthritis typically affects the cartilage. It wears down this protective rubbery layer at the ends of the bones, and that's kind of wear and tear degenerative arthritis. Kind of like the tires might wear out their treads over time. You only get so many revolutions of a tire. This cartilage will eventually wear down if you live long enough. About 20% of the population has osteoarthritis, which is symptomatic. Rheumatoid arthritis does not necessarily affect the cartilage directly. It, it rather attacks the inside 
lining of the joint capsule. And by making this lining very inflamed, it causes a, a great deal of destruction of the joint as a side effect to this attack on the inner lining of the capsule. This is an uh, autoimmune or your body attacking itself, especially the inner lining, the synovium, they call it, of the joints. So the rheumatoid arthritis is not necessarily attacking the cartilage, although all of the inflammation that occurs inside of the joint does spill over and start to destroy the cartilage. There are certain proteins and enzymes which will accelerate the degeneration of the joint as it gets inflamed. Osteoarthritis, which is typically what we think of as arthritis when somebody says, I have, I'm having a bad arthritis day, will cause the cartilage to degenerate. It also causes the bones to, to grow little osteophytes, little bone spurs along the edges of the uh, ends of the bones, and you can see those on x-rays. You can also get little pitting inside of the bones and, and fluid accumulation. You get the thinning of the cartilage. And you can see here an x-ray of a fairly normal appearing knee. You can see this black space between the, this is the femur here and the tibia there. And you can see that there is uh, black gapping right there, which is kind of normal. There may be slight narrowing of the inside of the knee on this picture relative to the outside of the knee. Uh, and there's four grades of osteoarthritis, anywhere from a normal thickness of cartilage seen in x-ray right down to bone on bone type of picture that you might see right here. You can see the outside of the, the inside of the joint in this case uh, being a little wider, but the outside of the joint is a, a little bit more narrow. This is what's called a grade three. It's almost bone on bone. When you get to the point of bone on bone, unfortunately there's, there's probably little help for uh, treating this non-operatively, although I will talk about some of the techniques we have for treating uh, end-stage osteoarthritis pain. But the uh, medicine today has not been able to figure out how to reproduce or grow cartilage very well. It is a very inert type of tissue that uh, is, is not very responsive to growth. Unlike bone, where if you fracture a bone, it heals by itself very quickly. Cartilage is just a very dormant, lazy, rubbery, long-lasting type of Teflon, which does have cells in it, but it, it can um, slowly regrow, but not with the fortitude of bone or skin, et cetera. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about regenerative medicine techniques for treating the arthritis at, towards the end of the lecture today. So this is an MRI of uh, of a normal looking knee. Again, you can see you've got some, a nice looking layer of cartilage on top of the bone. This is the tibia. This is the femur right here. Unlike this one where you can see this one has got a lot of narrowing in this joint space. You can see there's actually whiteness in the femur. This is swelling or irritation of the bone. This is a classic MRI for knee osteoarthritis. Other joints also can show the osteoarthritis. Here you can see a shoulder and you can you cannot see much of a joint space between the arm bone here, the humerus, and the shoulder joint right in here. And this shows, you can see here, a uh, bone spur that's developed off of the shoulder. This is a, a classic end stage arthritic joint, very painful. So that's a quick overview of the arthritides. The big thing to remember, however, is that you want to make sure that you that the arthritis that you have is not simply wear and tear. There are oftentimes other clinical symptoms for different types of, of more, I'd say, dangerous arthritis 
that uh, should be evaluated before you just conclude that you have just you're getting old kind of arthritis because there are symptoms that can affect the blood vessels, it can affect the nerves uh, and the muscles, it, a whole plethora of uh, other symptoms that should be evaluated before you decide that osteoarthritis is your official diagnosis. Okay, um, I won't go into the other 97 types of arthritis, uh, but uh, again, seek medical attention, get good evaluation uh, if you do have joint pain. So what do you do about it? Well, number one proven is exercise. Now the rule of thumb for exercise is you, you want to exercise in a pain-free area. You don't want to push into your pain. Don't think that you can beat the pain by just muscling through it. You want to be respectful of the pain, use pain as your guide, but it doesn't mean you have to be a couch potato. You can modify your activity levels so that you can stay strong, get fit, and not hurt yourself, and not poke the bear, not aggravate the arthritis, uh, because uh, exercise has been shown over and over and over again to be helpful for arthritis, especially osteoarthritis. What are the different methods of exercise? Well, you can certainly do the weightlifting, which is very good and it's controlled as long as you have good guidance on how to do so. Uh, walking is good, assuming you don't have significant pain when you're doing so. Water is the most forgiving. Aquatic exercise uh, is what we use with the Olympic athletes at Spine West because it unweights the body. It allows somebody to work their cardiovascular system and does not stress the joints uh, overly uh, beyond their capacity. Now, the thing about swimming or water exercise, it, it involves more upper extremity work unless you have a vest on. If you wear something that keeps you floating and you have an arthritic shoulder, uh, you can avoid the irritation of the shoulder by wearing a vest, keeping yourself floating, and then work the rest of your body. In rehabilitation, I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. So we specialize in non-surgical orthopedic and neurologic type symptoms. In the, the rule of thumb for rehabilitation is something called relative rest. So you want to continue your activity level even if you have a sore joint, but you want to protect the, the sore joint that you have. So just because you've got a, a painful thumb or an index finger, it doesn't allow you to watch TV all day. What you want to do is protect that joint, work the rest of your body, maintain your fitness, and uh, that, then your recovery will be that much better and you won't lose a lot of ground. Now, diet plays a huge role in pain and especially with arthritis. If you talk to anybody that has rheumatoid arthritis, you, they'll tell you that these kind of toxic foods like refined sugar, uh, processed foods, salt, will definitely affect the amount of pain that they feel. Dairy uh, is a mixed bag. Uh, it has calcium and vitamin D, but it also can be somewhat of a pro-inflammatory pro uh, agent. The, the, uh, what they recommend from the uh, arthritis societies is broccoli, cherries, citrus fruits, beans, the uh, blueberries is very good, nuts, oils such as olive oil, and different spices such as uh, turmeric, uh, avocados, uh, which have a lot of uh, omega-3 oils, fish, which is not in this picture, is also a very good natural anti-inflammatory. So I recommend you go to the website for say arthritis.org uh, and look at some of the recommend, recommendations for a good diet. That will change your pain first and foremost. For osteoarthritis, the number one 
rule is to unload the joint. The best way to do that is to perhaps put the fork down in between bites so that you can start to lose some of the weight that is not uh, needed and that will spare the joints. It'll prolong the lifespan of the joints as well. There has been some good research to, to show that balance training and Tai Chi is a very good treatment for arthritis. It is a very gentle, controlled type of movement that allows you to not only improve your balance, but it, it, it does mobilize or move the joints in a very controlled manner. As I said before, if you have a movement which causes you pain, you just don't do that. You, you be respectful of the pain of the movement, but you try to move the joints as best possible in the pain-free range. Yoga and stretching has also been quite good. The key for doing yoga, however, is to make sure you do it correctly. Uh, yoga is very, very effective both for the body and the mind, but there are times where if the technique is not good, you can actually cause yourself more harm than good. So make sure that you know what you're doing when you're doing the yoga uh, or the stretching. And again, keep it inside of the pain-free range. Now, what about uh, modalities? Either we call it modalities, things like ice or heat or infrared. Uh, in this picture, you can see what's uh, going to be a setup for a TENS unit, trans, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. And so this, these types of uh, external devices are safe. The evidence for them is a little bit, a little bit soft over the years. It's been it kind of been used uh, freely, but when they looked at the research, it's a plus minus response. The biggest benefit is that it is totally safe. The idea for the tens unit is that it blocks the pain signal that comes out of the area of of disease of the painful joint. It kind of blocks it so that your brain does not feel the pain as much. It's similar to rubbing your hand after you burn yourself on say a hot stove or something and you typically will rub it and shake it out. And what you're doing is you're trying to get more non-painful stimulus up to your brain than the actual pain response that you have from burning your hand. So the idea of a, a TENS unit ice heat is to kind of block the signal going up to the brain. Now ice also has the ability to clamp down the blood vessels, which allows decreased circulation if you have an acute flare up of your pain. So ice is good when you have when you're on the rise for inflammation. Heat promotes circulation and if you're tr if you're on a quiescent side, sometimes heat will make people feel better. The rule of thumb for ice, if you use it, is try to use uh, frozen water versus the blue ice packs. A blue ice packs can be cooler or colder than 32 degrees Celsius. And we have seen frostbite that develops from blue ice pack use. We haven't seen it with the ice, with the regular water ice, uh, such as a bag of frozen peas, et cetera, which are moldable and you can sh shape them around the body part, throw them back into the freezer and reuse that bag of frozen peas. Just remember to label them so you don't eat them for dinner after they've been thawed and frozen multiple times. Acupuncture has been shown to be helpful for an acute flare up. Uh, for long term maintenance of arthritis, it's a little bit uh, questionable, but in an acute situation, um, it has been shown to relieve uh, symptoms of pain. Uh, what, a, what about medications? Well, the anti inflammatory medications, aspirin, the non steroidal anti inflammatory medications like ibuprofen or Advil, uh, naproxen also known as Aleve, 
They work from the inside out. They do block the inflammation pathway of your body when you do get uh, an inflamed tissue. Uh, and they, that's kind of the first line of treatments. Aspirin has some secondary side effects. So I, I caution you on using aspirin as an anti-inflammatory medication. Uh, you're better with ibuprofen or the naproxen or, or Aleve. They do have topical types of anti-inflammatory medications, which are now over the counter. Voltaren gel is something that we have used for many years. It is now available without a prescription, and it is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication called diclofenac, which comes in a gel form, and you can rub that on your uh, sore body part, knee, etc. And uh, you can do that a few times a day, and there may be some benefit to it. Usually, it has minimal side effects, so it it can be something to to consider. There's also a hot chili pepper cream that you can get in stores uh, called capsaicin, which is made literally from hot chili peppers. And it down regulates a very painful substance called substance P, which pops up in a painful area of your body after injury. And by just constantly suppressing that substance P formation in your body, you can get some relief. The key for the for that type of the gel or cream, however, is that you have to keep applying it. Just like if you eat hot food, hot Mexican food, if you keep eating it, it's not quite as hot. The first bite is pretty painful, but thereafter you can maintain the tolerance by, by continuing the presence of this, of this medicine. So that's capsaicin. Now, what about, what about the squeaky joints? This is uh, the Tin Man, you know, the, as you age, you'd rather have the Tin Man's oil rather than uh, the, the slippers that bring you back to Kansas. So the, what we can do is sometimes inject medications into the knee. Uh, the classic medicine that we've used is steroids, also known as corticosteroids, different than uh, 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 adrenergic steroids like testosterone and estrogen, those are more the sex steroids. This is corticosteroids, which is a very strong anti-inflammatory family of medications, which basically suppress the inflammation inside of a certain area of the body. So if you have an acute flare of pain, you can rescue the joint in a sense and, and decrease the amount of discomfort and inflammation by injecting steroids into the joint. The other thing that we use is an oil that is made originally from rooster combs, rooster uh, called coxcombs, and we call it rooster juice, but there's now about 10 or 15 different manufacturers of similar type of knockoff oils that we can inject into the joints, especially the knee joint. It has not yet been approved by Medicare for other joints, but we do occasionally use it for that off-label. Um, and it, it may be helpful for some people. Sometimes it's not, but, but for, uh, for some folks, uh, they do get several months of relief out of the injections, and that is an alternative to taking pills. Uh, and so that's something to consider. Now, if you're going to do an injection, you definitely want to use ultrasound guidance is my suggestion, because that way you know exactly where the medicine is being placed. We always do our injections with ultrasound. Um, if you, the traditional way was to do it blind, and sometimes you miss. Uh, up to two-thirds of the time you may miss, depending on what joints you're injecting. So I strongly recommend that you have any type of injection done with ultrasound. Now, what about the up and coming treatments? Well, um, the regenerative medicine you've heard about, stem cells, platelet-rich plasma, that whole family of medicine, which is really taking off in the, in the advertising world. The, we've been doing regenerative medicine injections for over 10 years at Spine West. The 
the caveat for regenerative medicine is kind of buyer beware. There, there is some suggestion that it is helpful in certain conditions, especially tendonitis, et cetera. Some of the research for joint, re, joint regeneration, et cetera, is a little bit sparse and a little bit biased. Uh, the, the marketing is ahead of the research, so to speak. Uh, if, and it can be expensive because this is not covered by most insurance plans. So if you, if you have the money to try it, it is a safe option for you. Um, be careful about the cost of it, however. Talk to somebody that um, you know, has had success with it and make sure that it's money well spent. Again, we've been doing this for uh, quite a while. We are very picky about who we actually use this type of uh, medication on. The, the, the way we collect the stem cells, and especially the the stem cells comes from usually bone marrow or fat, uh, and they are, it's much more expensive. The stem cell research has not yet proven to be uh, completely successful, mainly because there's many steps involved with doing this stem cell harvest and also the injecting, and they don't even know how to control the stem cells. You know, they're to, to inject stem cells into a, a body cavity and then expect it to magically turn into cartilage or turn into bone or ligament, just transform itself. And even to find the area of damage is still to be decided how that's going to happen. Uh, if you walked into a room that had uh, paint off the walls and you took a spray can and you sprayed the room full of, sp full of uh, paint and you expect that all those little droplets of paint to find the bare wall and patch it up and turn it into the same color as the, the wall paint is a bit unrealistic. Platelet-rich plasma is, is a less expensive alternative. This is what we've, we've uh, kind of focused on recently. What this is, is growth factors that are spun out of the blood. We, we draw blood out of the arm, you spin it down in a centrifuge, and it isolates the, the layer that has the growth factors in it. It separates the red blood cells from the general fluid of the blood, and that little, that little layer has a lot of the growth factors, kind of like fertilizers that you might throw on the lawn to help things grow. That is the magic potion that we believe stimulates the natural stem cells inside of a joint and get, wakes them up, awakens them to actually start perhaps regenerating, especially the cartilage. The, the data, again, is still a little bit short on arthritis with regenerative medicine, but it is certainly a huge marketing wave that's going on right now. Uh, caveat emptor is my take home point. Some of the other advanced things that we are doing is the, we have the ability for people with end stage, say, knee osteoarthritis, and they either uh, are not a candidate for knee replacement surgery or they, they don't want to get surgery. Uh, then we can, we can cut or cauterize the nerves that, that give feeling to the inner part of the joint and in essence, decrease the amount of joint pain just by kind of clipping the nerves that, that go to the, that part of the joint. They're also using some uh, interventional techniques where they, they thread an artery down into the knee and they, they spray little bullets or little BBs into the arteries and they basically stop the blood supply to that part of the knee. Now this is all, that's still a bit experimental, but may be helpful for those with, again, uh, end stage arthritis, <clears throat> when they can't get a surgical, uh, they don't, they're not a candidate for surgery. The other thing they're doing is they're, the drug companies are looking at uh, compounds that actually can can perhaps stop the growth of the nerves or even kill the nerves inside of the knee. Um, the, the data has been a little mixed, so there's still, that is all uh, quite experimental. You can go to 
uh, the government website, uh, clinicalstudies.org and, and, or .gov and see which, uh, you know, what's going on as far as experimental studies. People are gonna ask, I'm sure, about marijuana. Yeah. So the research on marijuana is mixed. There's been a lot of publications uh, supporting the use of marijuana for arthritis. Most of the research and the, the, uh, the articles have been very biased. The, the actual uh, proven efficacy of marijuana for arthritis is still to be determined. However, there are, of course, anecdotal stories of people getting better with a topical cream or uh, edibles, et cetera. I, if you are going to delve into the world of CBD and marijuana, uh, my suggestion is to use something which has a measurable dosing schedule. Uh, I recommend like the tinctures under the tongue because you can count the number of drops that you use. Uh, and that way you have a consistent delivery of the, of the medication. If you do uh, a salve or some kind of skin-based treatment, that can be absorbed uh, differently on different days. If you're hot, you might absorb it more because there's more blood vessels in the skin. If you're cold, it might not absorb as well. Same with the edibles. You swallow something, it gets absorbed into your system, and then it gets uh, filtered by your liver. And sometimes the liver might take out more than it does, especially if it's mixed with other foods, etc. So the uh, the tincture is what I would recommend for uh, using for delving into the trial of medical marijuana. The one thing about marijuana, assuming you don't get psychotic with the side effects, is that it's safe. It can be expensive, but it is safe to to try. So, in summary, arthritis is a very it's a, it's a complex disease. Arthritis, again, is a general category of inflamed joint. That's all it means. The key take-home points is know what type of arthritis you have. If you do have joint pain, seek medical attention, get the correct diagnosis so that you can get the correct treatment pathway lined up. The, the best long-term treatment is, of course, exercise and the whole goal is not necessarily to get 20 year old joints again, but to enjoy the life. It's adding life to years, not adding years to life per se. And so it's about making sure that you have the ability to do the things you wanna do. There may be some compromises along the way, but it doesn't mean that you can't go out and enjoy, enjoy life. So that's the, End of my talk, we'll open it up for questions. I think you're muted, Al. Oh. Sorry, that's my fault, sorry about that. I always remember to unmute and I didn't this time, so I apologize. Um, so are bone spurs part of arthritis? Can they be massaged out or moved out? Um, uh, what can be done if they are really causing pain? Well, bone, sp bone spurs are simply your body's reaction to an area of irritation. Uh, kind of like maybe rust that develops on the side of your car if it's, if it's exposed to water and salt uh, over time. Or if you accumulate snow driving up to the mountains in your wheel well, it slowly accumulates. It, the bone spurs are not a disease in themselves they don't cause trouble unless they start to encroach on, say, a nerve in your neck, for example, or in your back, where they, it starts to grow and it now pushes the nerve up against the side of the other side of the bone, and then they cause symptoms. But bone spurs are simply, it's mostly a radiologic diagnosis. We see them uh, very commonly in anybody over 40. And just so you know, after 40, everybody shows signs of osteoarthritis. The, and the bone spurs uh, represent a chronic issue. It means that something's been brewing for a while. So you may suddenly have 
knee pain or shoulder pain or finger pain. Uh, and it doesn't mean that suddenly something changed, but it's almost like it, it just got tipped over to the point of being symptomatic. Seeing a bone spur implies it's been brewing for a while and now you're actually feeling it. So to answer your question, bone spurs don't need to be shaved off, uh, massaged, etc. They are simply, they just help radiologists and physicians tell you that you've, you've got a chronic condition that's been going on for a while. And it can be, they can be removed surgically though, if they're, if they're, if they're uh, bumping into a, to a nerve in the back or the neck, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's the one indication where they do, they do these um, osteophytectomies. They, they, they shave off the bone spurs because you always want to protect the nerves. Yeah. And so what tests do you have now for rheumatoid arthritis? You had mentioned the blood test. Are there other tests that would indicate rheumatoid arthritis versus osteo? Well, yeah, it's oftentimes rheumatoid arthritis is the clinical presentation of everything. So uh, again, the, the classic pattern for rheumatoid arthritis is pain that's worse in the morning. Uh, oftentimes involves the hands in a symmetrical they call it a palindromal pattern. So the, the right and left side of the body have equal, um, or the number of joints are about the same versus kind of a uh, one-sided joint pain. Uh, and the, uh, it can be associated, as I said, with other clinical symptoms like fevers, uh, weight loss, sometimes uh, kidney function. So the, the, primary, the primary diagnosis is a, kind of a, a whole construct of presentations, both the symptoms that you feel, that you present with. I've got morning pain and stiffness in both hands, typically in the, in the knuckles that are right here at the base of the fingers, both hands. And the blood work can help support the diagnosis with rheumatoid, effect, rheumatoid factor and some of the other, other uh, fancier labs. And you, there are other, other manifestations of a similar type of symmetrical pattern. You can have, for example, lupus. You can have uh, infections which cause what's called arthralgias or joint pains. But the, the, rheumatoid, diagno the rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis is based very heavily on the number of joints, the arrangements of the joints, the symmetry, and also on the, the blood work that develops. And are you more, more or less likely to get rheumatoid if you already have osteo? And you said everybody has osteo after 40. No, uh, the, the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the, 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 the source, the number of people that get rheumatoid arthritis is, is you know, maybe, uh, 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 I would say probably one-tenth, uh, even less than that, of osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is wear and tear. That is just aging. The rheumatoid arthritis is uh, what's called uh, an autoimmune process. It's where your body attacks itself. And uh, that's, uh, that's a whole different ballgame. We don't quite understand why that occurs. And so right now, the, the medical community is focused on treating once it does happen. And they'll try to suppress your immune system sometimes so it's not so actively attacking your body. And the other goal of the treatment is to minimize the damage caused by that swollen lining of the joints, uh, which then cause joint damage. So it's not, it's two different, it's apples and oranges, just because you can have both. You can have rheumatoid arthritis, and then as you age, you get osteoarthritis, but one does not predispose you to the other. And so we have a number of questions about exercise because exercise, you know, osteo, you said, is basically wearing out your joints. And, you know, the more you exercise, as Trump says, you're going to you're going to wear out your joints. Well, how do you balance non weight bearing exercise to protect joints with the need for weight bearing to treat and prevent and live with osteoporosis? Yeah, so so osteoporosis is maybe different. Let me bring up a slide here. Uh, Osteoporosis is a disease of the bones. And what happens, you can see the, the progression here is in this circle here, you'll see the, the white 
represents bone tissue, the hard calcium. And then the black are the small little holes in between the dense bone. As you lose some of the bone density, you get osteopenia and you get osteoporosis down here where you can see a lot of holes in the bone, almost moth-eaten uh, type of bone. And then this is severe osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is not painful until you break the bone. So you do not feel osteoporosis uh, happening. It's almost like uh, termites that are eating the, the wood of your house. You don't know it until the porch collapses and then you, then you find out that the boards are rotten because the, the, the structure, the strength of the bone has been whittled away uh, over time. So osteoporosis is different than osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is, is the joint pain versus osteoporosis. For osteoporosis, since we're talking about it, that is best treated by loading the joint, as you said, Al. The, you want to use weights, heavy weights if possible, not one pound little dumbbells a thousand times curling. You want to curl a thousand pounds once. Yeah, that's, that will give you more bang for the buck than, or juice from the squeeze than you will if you just do this a thousand times. Uh, astronauts get osteoporosis because they have no weight bearing gravity. That's one of the limitations with space travel is, is the bone starts to absorb over time when they have no, no weight bearing. So for exercise, for osteoporosis, what you want to do is try to do things in a controlled manner. You, want, you can do things sitting down. For example, if you have knee arthritis, you can still use weights in a sitting position. And you can see this is a great example. This person is not using just a, a one pound dumbbell. He's actually stressing the bones. What this, what this exercise, for example, does is he lifts the, the weight in his hands. The load goes, goes through the arm, up through the shoulder, down through the spine to his pelvis. It does not necessarily strengthen the bones of his legs, but it does strengthen his spine and everything above the waist just by using the heavy weights. So this is what we would call relative rest. You would spare the knee pain and you would use the, the weights to work the upper body. Now, if you have a, a lower extremity arthritis, osteoarthritis, say the knee joint or the hip joint, it can be more challenging. There you may have to do things uh, in a, kind of a semi uh, sitting position and you may not go all the way down doing the full extent of the exercise, say with leg presses or you know, standing, uh, bending your knees while you're standing. And you don't wanna go all the way down to the point where it hurts. But if you do have a, a pain-free range that you can exercise, you can actually accentuate that, the return on the exercise by holding a couple of weights in your hand while you're doing little dips. Uh, again, you don't want to go into the pain. You want to stay in the pain-free range, but if you hold some weights and you are slowly in a controlled manner, strengthening up your thighs, uh, you will develop um, one better protection for your joints and, your, and strengthen the bones at the same time. So it is a matter of uh, fine tune. It's not a one size fits all type of uh, treatment plan for people. That's why we will design specific home exercise programs for people based on what their limitations are. The, the, uh, the, the pool therapy one, you know, I mentioned that does not stress the bones very well. It's good for the aerobics. It's good for keeping things moving, but this, this is a little limited in, in strengthening. Yes. Thanks. And your feeling about eating uh, any or all of the nightshades, is one worse than another or better? Uh, as far as the, the diet? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it, is, there, it has been shown that there are natural anti-inflammatory foods. And that's, that's the bottom line. So anything that inhibits the inflammation is really the way to go. 
um, fish oil, uh, omega-3s, et cetera, uh, the uh, turmeric and curcumin, all that whole uh, family of, of foods is strongly recommended. In fact, turmeric has actually been shown to be anti-cancer, uh, has anti-cancer properties as well. So I strongly recommend that. But for the, for the inflammation, you want to maximize the natural anti-inflammatories and, uh, and minimize the, anything that is inflammatory. The, the, the big inflammatory foods are, is really anything that's um, you know, simple, simple carbohydrates, the, the prepackaged foods that you might get, sugars, simple sugars are, are notoriously uh, pro-inflammatory. And the, um, you know, and you can just, you can try it. You can have a very uh, high, uh, you know, take a big sugar load and see how you feel. And you will notice that it is just not the same as it's trying to abide by, say, the Mediterranean diet, et cetera. Um, a lot of questions still to, to, to get to. Um, okay. So, so uh, we have a question from Nancy who says she has rheumatoid arthritis and a bulging disc. After many years of attempts to help, my doctor has recommended a spinal fusion. Your thoughts? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not here to, 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 to make uh, you know, clinical recommendations for you. Here's, here, I can give you philosophical or general guidelines. Uh, spine, spine surgery is, definitely has a role in healthcare. It is usually, for a chronic condition like a bulging disc, it's usually the last stop on the train. You, know, you don't just start with surgery. You end at surgery, you know, having exhausted every other option that you can think of. The, the, the exception for that rule is if or when nerves are being compromised, whether it's a disc in your neck that's putting pressure on the spinal cord or pressure on the nerve that's going into your arm or your leg, and you may be causing death to that nerve, that is a surgical issue. That is, that is a, do not, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. That is a, you need surgery now if there's any signs of nerve compromise. And there are ways to test to see if the nerve has been damaged. Bulging discs are, are really a radiologic diagnosis. So you have to be careful about just treating the MRI with the bulging disc. Everybody over 60 is gonna have a bulging disc if you take an MRI, even if they have no symptoms. So the bulging disc is not necessarily a diagnosis in itself, um, other than say a wrinkle is a diagnosis that you're, you know, you're over 40. Uh, bulging disc means that you're over 40, basically. Now you can get bulging disc younger too, um, if the disc, however, is protruded and it's pushing on a nerve and it's causing nerve damage, that's a surgical indication. If you have significant functional limitation because of the bulging disc, and you, for example, if, you, if it's squeezing the nerves and you can't walk very far, that may be an indication for surgery. So the surgery is reserved for acute emergencies, especially involving neurologic issues, or as I mentioned, if you've got cancer or some other type of infection in the spine per se. Um, or if you've exhausted everything else and you're sure you've exhausted everything else um, and, you, and your life, the quality of your life is just not what you want it to be, then you can consider surgery. But surgery specifically for what we call axial pain, pain along the spine, not radiating to your legs, is sometimes, a, um, sometimes an iffy proposition. It doesn't always turn out well. So question about uh, 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 platelet-rich injections, which you, you talked about um, and were, were positive about. Um, what are the best, what, 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 what conditions uh, respond best to platelet-rich injections? Well, the platelet-rich platelet -rich plasma injections, we think of here at Spine West as, as being something that jumpstarts a sleepy dog. So if you've got say a chronic tendon condition, uh, tennis elbow, for example, or like we were talking about arthritis, if you've got a chronic joint problem, joint pain, and you've tried all the other types of treatments, using this growth factor solution, this platelet-rich plasma, which has a lot of different growth factors in it, um, using that to, to stimulate the body's own natural healing response uh, 
uh, has been shown to be effective for tendons, kind of chronic tendon injuries. Uh, the, uh, the joint benefits still a little bit, little bit wishy-washy, but again, it's safe to try. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, you know, when do you use it? Well, I would use, I would try things that are one covered by insurance or you, know, you don't have to pay out of pocket for and, and try things that uh, are not going to, you know, make you homeless. So you can't make the house payment because of the, the cost of things. Uh, platelet rich plasma tends to be, you know, fairly inexpensive, uh, certainly less than less than a thousand dollars. Stem cells can run many thousands of dollars, and and the stem cells has even less proven uh, efficacy than the platelet rich plasma at this point. So, um, so it's just a matter of trying to if you've got something that's chronic and you want to jumpstart it into a natural, get your body to rev up and try to wake up and naturally heal itself. It's worth trying. It's safe. Excellent. Um, so question about marijuana. Um, little, this person is confused about the marijuana treatment. You recommended tincture, but then you said uh, you would not get the high effects. So are you, re re um, are you recommending medical marijuana or CBD? Well, the, that, that's, that's the question. And the, uh, the, the research on marijuana is still developing. They don't really, there's so many compounds in the, this, the medical marijuana could be, should be a whole webinar in itself because it really is very complicated. There's a lot of bias in the, in this uh, marijuana space right now. The, the, the THC is what typically has the psychoactive effects, you know, the stuff that makes you high. The CBD does not have as much psychoactive effect. There is some debate about how much, uh, what's the ratio of CBD versus THC that you need to have the maximal effect. E even the manufacturing of all these medical marijuana is so unregulated, you don't even know what percentage is in, in it. You know, one, one batch you might get this week compared to next week. The, the standards are just not there yet. So the regulation's not there. What I would suggest if you're going to try it is uh, the, way, the way I was uh, informed about it is you, you want like a 50-50 combination, uh, CBD with THC or perhaps a little bit more CBD. Um, and the, uh, you want something that is a measurable dosing schedule. You want to buy from a reputable dealer that, that really knows the science of it. There are some, some <clears throat> um, marijuana uh, dispensaries that, that the owners really do know their, they do know the research. Sometimes the people behind the desk don't know. They're just hired to, to man the store and they don't really understand the medical side of marijuana. But if you talk to, usually if you talk to a reputable shop, you talk to their owner, they'll probably tell you this compound seems to work best for arthritis. This compound works best for, et cetera, you know, headaches, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I, yeah. We, we've had questions on, on and, and we've heard other presenters talk about uh, uh, corticosteroids or steroidal injections. Um, uh, how many can a person have in a specific joint before tissue damage occurs? Um, is there is there a rule of thumb on that, or is it or is it still questionable? Well, it it, it is a um, you know steroids were the the go to drug for arthritis. They found that like you say, uh, multiple injections can degrade the cartilage. It can, it can degrade the tissue. Uh, the the, the rule of three is thrown around in the healthcare system, but that no one knows why there's, it's the rule of three. Nobody knows the origin of that. They think it's because they missed two out of three times. And so the third time they finally got it. But um, the steroids, they do have a role. They, they, they're more of a rescue type of procedure, a type of medicine, because it really shuts down the inflammation cascade. It really just squashes that whole inflammation. And the inflammation is what causes much of the joint damage. If you get a shot of steroids and in, say into your knee, and then you go play a full game of football, you 
really set yourself up for, for accelerating damage because now you've got cartilage, which has got maybe a little bit of softness to it, and now you're really pounding it. So, so the, the biggest risk is accelerating arthritis from the steroids. And there's a lot of, you know, absolutely no steroids type of people out there. Um, and there's also people that are just injecting it like as if it were candy. You know, the rule of three in a year is, is probably good, but that's, you know, but doing that year after year is not good. So if you're really in an acute situation, you want to control the inflammation, you can do it a few times, but then you have to find an alternative. Otherwise, you, you're just, uh, you're just putting, uh, putting something in, which eventually will cause more harm than good. Uh, can, red, can red laser lights help arthritis or blood flow to a specific area? Well, uh, red laser lights uh, probably generate heat on the, on the skin. It would be analogous to putting any kind of heat pack or something that's, that uh, will uh, increase the circulation to the area. So it, it, it may feel good. It's certainly safe to do. Uh, it probably has n no difference than if you put a hot pack on, on the knee. Dr. Gronson, we could we could we could add another hour just to question and answers. There's still so many left to get to, but we, we're out of time. And uh, you know, you mentioned cannabis. Um, we're actually having uh, a session tomorrow on on cannabis. So I'm sure uh, many of the people that are on this Zoom uh, seminar would like to uh, would like to attend that one as well, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of new or expanded information. Um, you, you did an amazing job. Um, you answered so many great questions um, and your passion and your, and, your, uh, and your intelligence and the way you present all of this is really, is really very, very helpful to our, to our attendees. So we thank you so much. Thank everyone that attended again uh, and we wish everyone uh, a, a good afternoon.